Well, hello and welcome to the Deeper Walk Building Balance online conference. My name is Nick Harang. I'm the Director of Operations here at Deeper Walk, and we are so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, for those of you that are joining us live for this online conference, and those of you watching at a later time, we're really glad that we could record it so that you can catch it when you can. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some things that we find to be extremely helpful at any given time of life, but especially right now that we find ourselves in this global challenge of the corona pandemic, extremely relevant and valuable and very applicable. And I know that some of you are coming here today because you know you need some more balance for you. Uh, you've seen perhaps the image of the ball that's been a little bit deflated on uh, some of our uh, marketing and you're like, yeah, I need to put some more air in the ball. I need some more balance to help me navigate the hard things of life. Well, you're going to get a lot of practical tools and great insights from scripture and brain science and just years of practice from Stephanie Hinman, who I'll introduce in a moment, and Dr. Warner. And it's going to help you a lot. And I know some of you also are here because you not only want to grow your resilience, you want to help the people around you, your friends, your family, church members, community. And uh, so we are excited to equip you to help equip others with the very skills that are going to cause them to not just go through things and just survive, but really to thrive and to grow closer to God and grow healthier relationships, no matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Uh, very glad today to have our presenters, Dr. Marcus Warner and Stephanie Hinman with us. Uh, hello, Stephanie. Hello, Marcus. Welcome. Hello. Uh, hey there, Nick. So glad to have you guys, and you guys have been working on this content for a long time and have a book in the works that we'll be talking about in a moment. So uh, today's kind of a big day. It's, a, it's kind of the first official rollout of the, the full enchilada of what all this content has been um, <laughs> developing for some time. So in one sense, I think congratulations are in order. So thank you guys for all your work to bring this together. Yeah, it is a, a bit of a relief. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time it's uh, very exciting so yeah yeah well thanks Stephanie and uh, Marcus is joining us from Indiana in his home and uh, Stephanie's in Kansas and uh, I'm in Northern California so uh, wherever you are we're glad you're joining us today and for those of you that are new to Deeper Walk uh, let me uh, introduce Dr. Marcus Warner to you uh, Marcus is the president of Deeper Walk International he's been so for the last 14 years and uh, he's a prolific author. He's written over a dozen books on a number of topics, including leadership, spiritual warfare, uh, walking deeper with God, um, and the understanding the Bible, and many more. Um, but his passion is to take complex things that can change lives and just make it simple and accessible for people to understand and apply. And I know you're going to experience that today. Uh, and Stephanie Hinman is a board-certified Christian counselor and a registered art therapist. Uh, she's also the founder of Healing Expressions, where she works with individuals, families, and schools, as well as organizations in the areas of trauma healing and recovery, crisis intervention, and building resilient kids, families, and communities. So we are excited to hear from both of these people that have spent a long time developing the ideas that you're going to hear today, and they've seen them work in their own lives, in their families, and in the people that they've ministered to uh, through the years. So Thank you so much again for being here, Dr. Warner and Stephanie. And with that, uh, Dr. Warner, would you take us into session one? All right. Thank you, Nick. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to dive into this. Uh, let me give you a little background. Um, back in the early 2000s, I, I still find it remarkable that I teach on emotional stuff because, you know, when I first got into ministry, I was one of those guys who were like, emotions don't matter. You just got to kind of, you know, study the Bible and, you know, be a good person and everything else takes care of itself. And, I didn't think I had any issues. I didn't, none of this stuff made any sense to me. I, I was not the uh, kind of person who was all about, you know, uh, touchy feely, if you will. <laughs> and so it's kind of interesting that it, uh, now here we are trying to help with emotional resilience. And part of the, the reason for this is that I began to realize that I didn't have as much as I thought I did, that I was actually just really good at avoiding stuff that caused me to get triggered and avoiding things that caused me to, to be overwhelmed with my uh, emotions. Um, but the, the more that you grow and the more that you engage with life, the more you have to be a leader, the more that you have to be an, uh, with a family, the more that you find yourself interacting with politics, the more you find yourself interacting with all kinds of things in this world, you realize, wow, you know, I have, I have all these emotions that come up. What do I do with these emotions? How do I learn to regulate these emotions? How do I act like myself in the midst of them? And uh, so I said, uh, somebody asked me once why I've written so many books. And I said, I write books on things I needed 
And so as I study them, because I really want to grow in this area, I want to understand it. I, I, as I learn, I want to share with other people what, I, what I've learned. So along the way, um, a few years ago, Stephanie Hinman uh, got a hold of us at Deeper Walk, and she had created a curriculum for children to help them with emotional resilience. So Stephanie, you want to give us a little bit of the background about you know, that, that curriculum, how you got start and started in your interest with emotional resilience, and, uh, and then we'll dive in from there. Sure. So uh, right out of school, I got a job at a, a home for children who have severe behavior disorders. It's a residential home in the foster care system. And I, throughout my graduate years, worked there along as a side by side with a hospice, a local hospice. And so in those early years, I worked with children who'd seen more adversity in their short little lives than most people see in a, their entire lifetime. And uh, this question began to emerge in me, which is why do some children and their families? seem to grow stronger in times of trial and adversity and some collapse and crumble. And so around that same time, I began having children of my own. I had four children in five years. And so that pushed me to the edge of my emotional capacity. And um, so this question became even more important to me. I um, be knowing all the adversity that my children would face, I found myself um, confronting with the Lord, how do I protect my children? How do I help them navigate this world that they are going to be living in that seems to be increasing in adversity? Um, and so through those years of working with families, doing the research, um, we did a long-term study with a, a local hospital here and um, did a lot of um, pre-testing, post-testing, and um, worked out this database that we had a lot of research on what made adults more resilient, but we didn't really have any on what makes children more resilient. So we took the adult research and we uh, translated it into a way that we could teach it easily to children. And what we found was that it worked. The children we worked with became more resilient. And but then yet again, there was this next um, roadblock where I began to realize that I could work with a child. I could teach them about emotional capacity. I could teach them to express their feelings. But if they went home and it wasn't safe in their home, then that could actually create more trauma and they could get punished for expressing their emotions or, um, or something along those lines. And so I began to realize that um, we have to really get this information into the hands of families and communities, schools, uh, because when we have healthy, resilient families, we have healthy, resilient children. No, and, and uh, so, so when she sent her material to me, I took a look at this and I was like, hey, this syncs so well with what, uh, what we're trying to teach, what we're trying to learn, and the things that I've learned from Dr. Wilder, from Chris Corsi, from the folks at Life Model Works and Thrive, and then having Stephanie bring a kind of a fresh perspective into some of this to add some things to uh, what I've been learning. And it was, uh, it was a really good uh, blend. So that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to start with session one. And uh, session one, uh, get my computer working, are two essentials of emotional capacity. So this starts with the brain science of the whole thing. And that is, what is it that we need? So defining emotional capacity, first of all, it is the ability to handle weight. And I got this definition from Dr. Wilder, and it's basically the idea that you can tell who the most mature person is in any room by who can handle the most weight without falling apart, right? Without blowing up, melting down, whatever, you know, shutting down, who can handle the most, uh, the most weight. And to put it in rare leadership terms, um, remain relational, act like themselves, and return to joy. So as you see, we got a picture here of a, uh, of like a, a walking bridge, and it can carry a certain amount of weight, right? You know, there's, you know, you'd, you'd feel good maybe walking across that bridge, but you probably wouldn't want to drive your car across it. On the other hand, we've got, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge here, and you think about the difference in capacity, right? How much weight can it hold? And you say, well, this has a whole lot more capacity than the other one. 
in the same way, um, emotional capacity is built, built all this idea of how much does it take before I, I, I get triggered. And when I get triggered, I either shut down, I blow up, or um, things fall apart in my life. So like Stephanie, you were talking about, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Siegel uh, and flipping the lid as an example of, of what we were talking about. It's just like another way of looking at emotional capacity. You wanna explain that to them? Sure. Uh, so if we look at uh, emotional capacity, like our emotional immune system, the stronger it is, um, the better we're able to rebound from adversity. Um, we have sort of an, a capacity wall. It's sort of the end of our capacity, and uh, that can, it's always growing. We can continue to grow it, but at any given time, um, when we assess that we don't have the internal or the external resources to handle whatever might be in front of me that feels really overwhelming, um, we call that being triggered. Triggered can, triggers um, diff are different for everybody. They kind of come over time through our experience. But when we get triggered, our brain um, uh, sends messages, the, the autonomic nervous system sends messages that there's danger and it's time to kick in a whole new backup system. When that backup system takes over, we go into fight, flight or freeze. So Dan Siegel, when we teach this to kids, we talk about it like flipping the lid. So if, if, if everything is calm and I feel safe and I feel connected, my prefrontal cortex is online, I'm thinking like myself, I'm acting like myself, I'm, I'm able to learn, I'm able to um, be creative. But uh, when my system goes then into fight, flight, or freeze, I flip my lid, I lose access to this, and I'm now just acting out of my emotional brain. And the emotional brain is only concerned with, is this safe or is this not safe? And so I lose access to all this beautiful thinking up here. Yeah, it's really much a survival instinct, isn't it? Because you go from, from being who I am to just wanting to survive what you're going through. And that survival instinct uh, loses the ability to remain relational, to act like yourself, to be creative, to solve problems well. And uh, you can very quickly find yourself uh, treating other people like enemies instead of treating them like uh, uh, other human beings to relate to. So I thought that was a good, good ana analysis. So let's take a look at this. When we say there are two essentials of emotional capacity in the brain, what we're talking about, first of all, is that there is a joy center. Now, Stephanie just mentioned the, uh, the right orbital prefrontal cortex, okay? So you think about it, orbital means eye. So right orbital means right behind the right eye. And prefrontal, well, you can hear frontal there. So this is the front part of your brain. And the cortex means that it's at the top part of your brain. So it's at the top, it's at the front, it's right behind your right eye. This part of your brain, uh, we have a lot of different terms for this part of the brain. Dr. Wilder calls it the captain in some of his uh, writings. Uh, we call it the joy center. We called it the identity center. In rare leadership, we call it the, the action center. Uh, and, and the reason is that this, this part of the brain really is the part of my brain that thinks of itself as me. And so because of that, it's like if I have an accident to this part of my brain, I can literally forget who I am. I can forget how it's like me to act. I can forget how it's like me to uh, interact with the world. In the same way, when I flip my lid, right, if I go like this and I, and I get triggered and I lose access, the brain activity to this joy center in my brain can get shut off. And what happens is I can't find my way to live out of joy. I can't find my way to act like myself since the identity center and the joy center are the same part of the brain. And so when we get triggered, one of the uh, uh, problems here is that if I don't have the emotional capacity to continue on being myself, even though I'm feeling a certain emotion, that emotion will take over. It'll literally shut down a part of my brain and keep it from functioning. So I won't be able to find joy. I won't feel like myself. <clears throat> and uh, that's, that's really important. So one of the essentials that has to happen to, to build a capacity is that this part of your brain needs to get really well developed. Now, we're gonna be as practical as possible as we go through here. So we talk about how do we build emotional capacity? We're gonna talk about A, B, C, right? A, B, C, appreciation, beliefs, and connections. 
And so the idea here is the fastest way to grow a large joy center and a really well um, developed joy center is through the practice of appreciation. So we're going to have a whole session here just on ways of practicing appreciation, what we mean by this, how do you learn to quiet, you know, and, and, and so if you have a well developed joy center, you will, your capacity to quiet your other emotions will increase and your ability to live with joy will increase. So the joy center is the first major thing. When we say there's two essentials of emotional capacity, you need a really big joy center is number one. And number two is you need joy pathways. And what we mean by this is that there's a front part of the brain and the back part of the brain. When we're living in joy, we're in the front part of our brain. When we lose joy and we go into negative emotions, our brain activity goes to the back. And there are, um, and you can think of our various negative emotions as, as different points on the back of our head. And we need a separate bridge or a separate pathway back to joy from each one of those negative emotions. So because of that, I might be good at returning to joy from sadness, but not good at all at returning to joy from anger. Or I could be pretty good at returning to joy from shame, but I can't return to joy from, uh, from despair or something like that. So I, uh, learning how to return to joy and building these joy pathways is the second uh, key ingredient to emotional capacity. So I know, um, Stephanie, you got a book called Bridges, right? You've written some things on bridges. You want to tell them a little bit about uh, the, uh, your, your understanding of how we build bridges, you know, in this, uh, from upsetting emotions back to joy? Yes. Yeah, so Building Bridges was the name of um, the first uh, resilient, it was a trauma-informed resiliency curriculum, um, resiliency building curriculum. And so we talked about, um, when I talk about the joy center, well, um, I talk about me feeling safe, calm, and connected. And that refers to um, our attachment, feeling a secure attachment and feeling um, safe in the moment, feeling like my body is calm, all feels well in the world. I feel like I'm acting like myself. People are happy to be with me. And then um, we talk a lot about the, the big six overwhelming emotions. Um, well, first we talk a lot about emotions and how um, we all have emotions. They're, you know, it's a part of the human experience. They're like the weather, they color our day. And, um, and then we talk about the big six. And so the big six are the ones that we've been talking about here today and building pathways back from each one of them back to the feeling safe, calm and connected. Um, those are the neuro pathways, but we call them bridges. So we might, um, and we'll do some of this today, we might think of a time I felt safe, I felt calm, I felt connected. And then we might, um, we might go around and talk about what does it feel like to feel overwhelmed, you know, noticing in our body how our body changes and how we feel different when we start to feel overwhelmed or maybe a time I felt overwhelmed. And then we'll, we'll build a bridge from overwhelm back to calm. And so each child over the course of the program will have had an opportunity to try out a lot of different variety um, kinds of coping strategies. Um, we kind of engaged a lot of different medium like art and movement and music and um, play so that children have a chance to decide what they like best, what works best for them. You know, for adults, it might be a bath works really good for one person and another person hates baths. So you just kind of have to experiment and decide what works for you in um, returning back to calm, safe and connected. That's great. So you can think of these joy pathways as bridges right back to, uh, back to the joy center, or you can think of them as just pathways that form as the, as uh, neurons fire, they wire is kind of the expression. So as neurons fire together, they wire together. And then over time, they get wrapped with white matter, which makes, which if we can get to the point where I not only have a pathway back to joy, but I have traveled that pathway so often, it happens. So it begins to happen almost automatically so that I'm not even thinking about it. And that's the ultimate goal. I mean, when you get to that point, um, your emotional capacity has been developed pretty significantly. We probably need to put a caveat in here too, and that is that there is no such thing as infinite capacity except for God, right? So only Jesus, you know, and his Father, the Holy Spirit, only God has infinite capacity. So all of us at some point or another run out, right? And when we run out, we need replenishment, we need people to help us, we need, uh, we need something uh, uh, more. But the goal here is to grow the capacity we do have so that we don't get overwhelmed as easily and that we can re recover more quickly. We can bounce back more quickly 
uh, when we do uh, face you know, difficult emotions. So what we want to do now is kind of walk you through the brain science underneath this. So what I've uh, developed here is, is kind of a quadrant. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a quadrant with a vertical line, a horizontal line. And you can think of this uh, in, in brain terms as the cortical line. That is, things are subcortical or they are above the cort or they are cortical or they are subcortical in brain terms. Um, in and to make this as simple as we can, the cortical you can think of as the conscious part of your brain. Now on the right side of your brain, when I'm conscious, I'm simply aware. I'm not necessarily putting words to things, but there's an awareness. There's a, what you might even call mindfulness. I'm, I am mindful of what's going on in my world around me. There's a conscious awareness of, uh, of life. On the left side of my brain is where I begin putting words to my conscious what we're on there. So you can think of the left side as where conscious thought takes place whereas this is conscious awareness. So, you know, you can kind of divide them that way. And then we have the subconscious. And what that means is subconscious means these things are happening before it gets to the point of being conscious. There is a whole lot of activity taking in our brains before it gets there. Also, what we're going to find is that there is a circuitry to the way the brain works and that it starts on the bottom right, it comes up to the top, jumps to the left and goes out. So you can almost think about it like electrical wiring. And it, it, it comes up from your your... Uh, nervous system up through the uh, spinal cord into the right side of your brain first and then it goes up to the top of the right of your brain jumps across to the left and then it comes down and so part of what that means is that what happens on the left side of the brain is going to have a lot of effect on what's coming out <laughs> and that's why our, our ABC appreciation is really about how do we build this joy center B is beliefs and that has to do with how what we think about life because our beliefs have an awful lot to do with what ends up coming out of us. And so uh, we want to uh, address that as well. So um, we're going to, so you can think about appreciation is growing the joy center. Beliefs is what's happening on the top left side of the brain. Connections is what's happening on the right side of the brain. In fact, the entire right side of the brain can be thought of just as a, a big connection en uh, engine. It's just an engine that's driven to form attachment. And what it wants more than anything is joy. In fact, I was rereading something from Dr. Wilder a couple weeks ago uh, where he said uh, that uh, nobody ever goes to therapy for too much joy, right? <laughs> you don't sit around going, man, I really need to go get some counseling. I've just been at way too much joy lately. It's like we, uh, and, and joy is literally the only emotion that a baby will pursue, right? They will go out of their way to pursue joy. And so joy is the emotion, if you will, that our, our brains are designed to run on. And God wired us this way that we are constantly seeking joyful connections with other people. And so you think about it as if God wants us to have joyful connections with him. And so every day the priest would say to the people of Israel, you know, may you know God's shalom and may you have the, the joy of his face shine upon you, right? And it's this idea that peace and joy come from our connection to God and then our connection to his people and then our connection to one another. And God wants us to have these joyful connections. And so connections play a really big role in building our emotional capacity. We come over here to beliefs and then our beliefs are either going to attack those connections or they're going to help make them more, uh, more available. And that is some beliefs, you know, say, don't connect, don't connect, don't connect, you know, scary, scary, scary. And that other beliefs are, um, are helping us be more loving people. They're helping us uh, to live more like ourselves. And so uh, we'll talk more about this, but you can think beliefs is kind of the left side, um, the left side of the brain, the engine over there is really a beliefs driven engine. And the right side of the brain is a connections driven engine. So you can think about uh, the two sides of the brain sort of this way. So again, you can see where we get ABC from, appreciation, beliefs, connections, comes right out of the way that the brain functions. So let's take a look at the bottom quadrant of this brain. And so this again is on the connection side of the brain. The bottom right is the attachment, the assessment center. And these two things, um, basically what happens is your brain lights up whenever anything is personal. So that's your attachment center lighting up. Now, you notice the word of nucleus accumbens there. The nucleus accumbens is the part of your brain that craves things. So when your nucleus accumbens is craving joyful attachment, but, neutral, but uh, joyful attachment is not available, it will start craving something else. And that's why 
um, sometimes if there's nobody around, you eat a lot of chocolate or you eat a lot of ice cream, right? <laughs> because I can't find the joyful attachment that I'm really craving, so I start craving this. And this can, you know, escalate to points where I'm now craving alcohol, I'm craving cocaine, I'm craving heroin. Almost all addictions are related to this attachment level of the brain where I am forming cravings for and attachments to non-relational substitutes of the actual joyful relationships that I'm craving. So the attachment center is very uh, um, important. And I think it's interesting that God designed us that that's the first part of our brain that is interacting with the, interacting with the information that's coming in. And then as soon as, uh, as soon as our brain lights up that something is personal to me, it goes immediately to the assessment center, which can give one of three assessments. And that is, this is a good attachment, this is a bad attachment, or this is a scary attachment. And this happens before you have a chance to think about it. Notice it's not your belief center that's making this assessment. This is happening automatically before you have time to even think about it. And, uh, and this is where triggering happens if it's going to happen. So in other words, if I get an assessment of good, you know, there's no problem. The brain just keeps on functioning. I have nothing to overcome, nothing to bounce back from. But if I get a bad or scary that's going to trigger that FFF response. So Stephanie, you want to just walk them through the FFF response a little bit and, you know, what that, uh, <clears throat> kind of your understanding of how that operates? Sure. So uh, fight, flight, or freeze is the, so the nervous system works like a car engine. Um, there's, we have a gas pedal, we have a brake. When we need to get up and go and do life, we push on the gas and we have the energy to get up and take care of our families and go to work and do the things we need to do. Um, and then at the end of the day, we need to be able to have our break so that we can rest, digest, enjoy the day, enjoy connection. And so the idea is, is we, we learn how to navigate life by engaging these two systems. We don't want to slam on the brakes or slam on the gas. We want to do it nice and gently. Um, that's how we're, we're supposed to run. Um, we do have some um, built-in backup systems. And so um, if, if we assess danger, you know, we go into the fight or flight, our bodies get just dumped with the stress hormones that we can either fight the bear or um, you know, do what we need to do. And then the idea is that when the crisis is over, our bodies slip back into that, um, that rest and digest. So um, what happens is with trauma or with um, toxic stress is that we can get stuck. Either our gas pedal is stuck and we're revving, 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 or our brake is stuck and we just can't get out of bed. Yep. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've experienced both of those. I've had times in my life where the uh, pedal was stuck to the floor and I could not quiet my body. Like I, I would feel my hand shaking constantly. I would feel, you know, burning in the back of my neck and my face, right? You know, you, your heart is racing. Cause, and what's happening is like the, uh, this, the amygdala, which is the second level of the brain, um, is something has convinced it that it needs to be constantly sending a warning to you. And so you're staying in a hype, heightened um, uh, case of, of this kind of overwhelm. So that can happen with the flight response is, you, I, I think, a claustrophobia. Like, I just got to get out of here. I can't, you know, I can't be here anymore. It's that feeling that I just need to run. And then the fight response is, is a result of uh, saying that something is bad. So flight tends to come from this is scary. Fight tends to come from this is bad. And it makes me just want to make this stop, right? This is has to stop right now. I am done with this. And so anger is, is a motivation to make something stop that I don't like. And, uh, and so what happens is a lot of us, if we've never learned how to bounce back from different difficult emotions, we can get stuck right here. And if we get stuck right here, notice what happens is we lose access to the top right-hand quadrant of our brain. And as we're going to see right now, the top right-hand quadrant of our brain is extremely important to us being able to be ourselves, uh, uh, regulate our emotions, um, and, and continue to keep our identity uh, the way it's supposed to be. So we go up to the attunement center and then the action center. The action center you can think of as the joy center in the brain that we had talked about before. And uh, attunement is essentially my ability to be aware of the world around me 
and read it correctly. So one of the primary tasks of the cingulate cortex, which is the attunement part of my brain, is to read body language. So for example, even now through video, you can kind of read body language and you can see if uh, you know one of us looks bored or if one of us is really passionate about something and you can kind of read and go, oh yeah, that, you know, they look like that's what's happening. So there's also been studies that come out that, that America's been spending so much time on Zoom and internet video that there is a fatigue setting in because the speed at which the brain processes this information is way faster than the speed at which the video can send you the signal. And so your brain gets exhausted trying to, you know, constantly stay engaged with this person on the other end of a video line because we are designed to attune way faster than that. And so it can actually wear you out a little bit if you're on, if you're going from one Zoom meeting to another all day long. So um, that's, uh, that's part of the dynamic there of what happens. Uh, the attunement center is also designed partly so that I can be doing a task, but remain aware of the world around me in case something dangerous does show up or in case something good shows up that I should be aware of. Like if I'm doing my work and I, I should notice if one of my children has a need and I need to go take care of them. So I can be doing, I can, so my left brain can be focused on my task and doing this while my attunement center is staying aware, consciously aware of the world around me. And, uh, and, and so when my child comes in, I may become consciously aware of the fact that they're there, but then at some point I need to now shift and give them my attention. Um, but it's the attunement center is the first thing that picks up on what's going on around me that reads the body language, reads the signals of the things that are going on. The, uh, the next part then is the action center. And this is the, the most important part of the brain because this is the part of the brain that has the ability to regulate um, how I respond to my fight, flight, or freeze reactions. So if I can keep access to this part of my brain, I can kind of walk myself through regulating my emotions. Right? It's not that I, so being in my joy center doesn't mean I don't feel fear, right? Being in my joy center doesn't mean I don't feel anger. It doesn't mean I don't feel shame or the other uh, emotions we may talk about. What it means is that I still feel like myself while I'm dealing with this emotion and I can kind of walk myself through regulating that emotion. So I'll have Stephanie comment on this in just a minute, but let me give you uh, uh, one example. In, in infants around 18 months of age, up until 18 months of age, the baby's brain functions as if they are a completely different person with every emotion they feel. So you might say we're all born multiple personalities, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of like we all have a different personality for every emotion we feel. And around 18 months of age, which is also about the beginning of what we call the terrible twos, <laughs> that's the time when our brain is learning how to stay a single person regardless of how I feel. And that is, how do I still be me when I'm mad? How do I still be me when I feel shame? How do I still be me when I feel fear? And, and how do I form an integrated self, regardless of what emotion that I'm feeling? So during those terrible twos, from about 18 months to four years of age, if I go through that in a, in a healthy way, I will have experienced all kinds of negative emotions but will have successfully navigated those emotions with the help of, the, uh, of people in my life such that I'm not overwhelmed by them and my brain doesn't see them as a reason to turn into somebody else. However, if I get through that 18 months to four year window and there's a, there are some of those emotions I don't get those, that, that development with, then I can still be 60 years old. <laughs> and when that emotion comes up, I turn into a different person. I don't act like myself because I have never learned that skill. I've never developed that capacity. So when we talk about, that's why we say the joy center, the identity center, the action center, it's all the same center of the brain. It's this right orbital prefrontal cortex. And as this, so this all together kind of describes what is happening on this uh, connection side of the brain that, that is designed by God to, to want to, to crave healthy connections to form healthy connections and to stay relational regardless of the emotions that I'm feeling. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong here. And when we need to bounce back from things, oftentimes it's not just our beliefs. It is something going on in this side of the brain that needs our attention. And that's why we, uh, we're giving it um, the focus that we are right now. So uh, Stephanie, anything further you want to add on this? Um, I would just, I guess, add that this, it, you know, as you were saying, 
ideally develops in the early childhood when uh, there's a attunement between the parent and the child, and the parent is able to offer a healthy regulated uh, nervous system to the child, and the child be learns this process by co-regulating with mom or dad or caregiver. And so um, as, as the child grows, they, they grow in their ability to then learn to self-regulate to get to that action center. Right. And um, so if we, don't, if we don't learn those skills in childhood, what we know is that we can learn them at any time. And so that's really good news. So we can continue to build those pathways in our brain and learn how to get better and better at um, self-regulating. Yep. Now, you know, you notice that there's also an on-off switch here. And the, the on-off switch that we mentioned, notice, can either happen at level two or level three? If it happens at level two, um, we don't remember that the event ever happened. So you think about amnesic trauma, where something so bad happened that I don't remember it. That means that uh, by the level two part of my brain is what shut, you know, shut everything down. If I shut down at level three, if that's the, the switch that flips things off, I will remember the pain. I will remember the, ups, you know, the upsetting memory, but it, but it won't forward what needs to be forwarded to the top part of my brain in order for me to act like myself and return to joy. So um, that's, that's kind of, you can think about it this way, that uh, on this part of my brain is, is, is where all the relational circuitry in my, in my brain is located. So if I'm going to be my relational self, I'm going to stay relationally engaged with people. Um, it's very important that I learn to regulate this on off switch. And that is how do I get my relational switch on so that I get access to the relational part of my brain. And I'll be honest, it's still, there are certain things I'm, I still struggle with on this. Like if, you know, there are, there are things like in, in my marriage that Brennan and I can talk about, and it's no problem talking about the problems and the emotions and keeping the relationships switch on. There are still some things that when it gets triggered, man, it's hard to keep the relational circuits on because that's a, a less developed part of, of the brain. So what that does when, I, when I'm recognizing that I get triggered by something, it can turn into good news because what that means is when I recognize that, hey, this is triggering me, it tells me this is where I need to be focusing some work, right? I need to be focusing some attention here that I, I apparently have trouble getting back to joy from this emotion. So we're going to focus some attention on that, which means I'm going to start talking to Jesus about that emotion. I'm going to start working on skills related to that emotion. I'm going to look at what my beliefs are about that emotion, you know, but so you can take these triggers that happen in your life and you can turn them into opportunities for growth by saying, okay, the very fact that I got triggered by this means I have uh, some growth I need to do. Let's start uh, diving into that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, go to the next part of the brain over here. So you notice we said before that the brain activity comes from the, uh, from the spine up into the right side of the brain, and then it comes over to the left. And so what happens is I may feel, let's use shame as an example. I may feel shame over here, which is the feeling that I'm not bringing you joy. Okay, so the right side of my brain will sense, it'll read your body language, and it will sense that I'm not bringing you joy right now, and I begin to feel shame. Now, shame is a demotivating, you know, it's like, oh, it makes me want to hang my head. It just makes me not have a lot of energy. And so now the shame goes over to the narrative engine. Now the narrative engine is going to explain why I feel shame. And this is where shame becomes toxic, is actually on the narrative side of the brain. Because the, the narrative might be, well, they're not happy to see you because you're such a bad person or you're such a loser, or you're so worthless or whatever. But it's now giving a meaning to that feeling. And uh, that meaning is often where our shame becomes toxic. Um, so we see this with a, a lot of different things that sometimes our emotions are generated on the right side of the brain and then our left brain gives meaning to those emotions. Other emotions are actually generated in the left side of the brain by what we believe about things. And we'll see this in a moment because when it gets down then to the subconscious part of that narrative engine, um, this, uh, what happens is that beliefs actually begin driving my emotions at that point. So there is a difference between attachment-based emotions and belief-based emotions, okay? These are our brain basics. And this is one of the things I wanted to point out. An attachment-based emotion is that it, it, it's the feelings I have before I even think about things. And they're usually related to the fact that <clears throat> I want to be with you, but I can't, 
or um, I want to be with you, but I'm afraid of you, or I want to be with you, but you make me angry. You know, it's like, I, I've got all these mixed emotions going on over here. And it's not that I'm analyzing it and thinking about it. I'm just having these reactive emotions to what's happening relationally in my life. So there are these attachment based emotions that I can have. And that's, um, uh, those are the big six. When we talk about the big six negative emotions, they are the right side emotions. And those are shame, fear, disgust, right? Shame, fear, and disgust are the first three of the big six. And then it's sadness, anger, and uh, despair. So um, in talking to, to Dr. Wild about this further, because he was like, you know, anxiety is, is a completely left brain emotion. Anxiety is anchored in beliefs. So technically anxiety is not a right brain emotion. It is fear. So it is shame is I don't bring you joy. Anger is I want this to stop because I'm not liking how this is making me feel, especially relationally and in my attachments. Um, fear is I want to get out of here. I don't trust this. You're scary, right? Uh, and you just go down the list. All of these big six negative emotions have their anchor and attachment. Now, if you go to the left side of your brain, I can feel every one of those emotions based on what I believe that have nothing to do with attachment. So for example, if I simply believe you're scary, I can have an emotional reaction in the bottom left quadrant of my brain <laughs> that it reacts as if you're scary, even though the right side of my brain never really sent me that signal. Um, and so there are, it, it's helpful to understand that there are Com two completely different engines in your brain driving our emotional state. And because of that, they take different solutions. And um, so if correcting your beliefs will resolve all of the belief-based emotions, but correcting your beliefs doesn't uh, take care of all the attachment-based emotions. So you need different interventions that are taking place there and you diff need different skill sets uh, for dealing with these things. So once again, this is where we get our uh, ABC. Um, <laughs> this, I, I, I feel like apologizing because this probably should be a whole session, but we, uh, you know, this is just a part of one of the chapters. So uh, we wanted to mention this. Uh, Dr. Carl Lehman in his book, Outsmarting Yourself, talked about the pain processing pathway. And honestly, it took me a while to realize that the pain processing pathway is essentially just the four levels on the right side of the brain and the left brain narrative, right? And that is, uh, the pain processing pathway says that, basically says that, well, let me just walk you through all this because I think it'll be easier if you see it all. When pain completes this pathway, trauma resolves. Or if my pain completes this pathway in the first place, I don't get traumatized by my suffering. In other words, if I can stay attached, if my, if my attachment center stays on, the assessment center stays on, my attunement center stays on, my action center where I, I, I can experience joy and act like myself stays on, and I come up with a satisfying narrative, I can suffer without being traumatized by the suffering. On this, in the same way, if all these things, if they have shut down at some point because of my suffering, getting them back on and functioning is the key to resolving that pain in my past, and completing this pathway is what resolves trauma. So, for example, a lot of us are, are familiar with inner healing, where Jesus shows up in memories and, and meets people. And you think about what he does is that he connects with them so that he, and he begins resolving all the attachment issues in their memory, and he gives them a new narrative about what happened in their past so that they end in a state of appreciation for Jesus and what he's done. And so Jesus in, in himself walks people kind of through connections, beliefs, appreciation and boom you know it's like all of a sudden there is healing now this memory has like been completed my brain is freed up to complete the circuits and uh and and it all uh continues uh continues on in the same way there are different ways that we can intervene that are directly related to each one of these levels so we have suggest i'll go back through this now that you've seen it let me uh walk this through so Suggest is related to narrative, and that is if my problem is that my beliefs are off, then as somebody trying to help the other person, making a suggestion of a different thing to believe can be helpful. Like, well, have you looked at it from this perspective? Have you thought about looking at it this way, right? Let's, let's try this. The uh, next one is uh, show. 
And that is at the action center, I'm like, well, this is what it would look like to do this. Maybe they've never seen anybody handle anger before. It's like, what do you mean? You know, somebody can get mad at you and you can actually act like yourself. What does that even look like, right? You can show them what that looks like. That, that's a, a different intervention. Um, support is the idea of let me do this with you, right? Let's go do this together. Let, I, I've shown you how to do it. Now let's do this together. Let's practice. Let's be engaged and, and connected as we go through this. And then there's soothing. And that is my amygdala is firing. I'm angry. I'm frightened, whatever. It's like, okay, let's help you get your breathing under control, right? Let's help you, you know, calm your body down. Let's, go, let's help you soothe, soothe through this. And then finally is sharing. And sometimes you just sit with the person, you sit there and you share the experience with them because they just need somebody to be there. And so you can kind of see that all of these interventions are related to different uh, parts of this pain processing pathway. And the pain processing pathway is essentially these four levels of the brain plus the narrative uh, engine. And so uh, when it comes to emotional healing, we understand this is why we're big proponents of, of, of inner healing and connecting to Jesus because it's the most effective process we found for helping people do that. And if this is where you're, you're stuck and what you're looking for, we encourage you to get uh, the book, Understanding the Wounded Heart, which walks all through um, uh, various tools and, and strategies for doing that. What we're going to be focusing on here is not the emotional healing part of building bounce, but the skills part of building bounce. All right. And that is uh, uh, emotional healing is extremely helpful. It's a vital part, but we got a book about that. So what we're writing this book about is how do I build the skills and what are the skill sets I need and how do I build those so that I become a more resilient person? So there's our uh, picture uh, in a nutshell. And uh, that brings us then to our, whoops, there it is, our ABC. So this is where we're heading today. We're gonna, uh, our next session is on appreciation and quieting. That we'll be taking a look at beliefs. How do we win the battle for our mind? And we're talking about connections. You know, how do I build my relational skill set? and uh, also build greater relationship with God. So, all right, Nick, I think I'm ready to turn it back over here to uh, wrap up our opening session. So that was a Great. lot of material, but. Yeah, foundation. that was a, a deep dive in right there in session one, <clears throat> but uh, we do have four more sessions and we'll be going a little bit more slowly through some of the uh, other content in the book. So very excited to, uh, to do that. And this time I wanna open it up for some Q and A. Uh, it's also a time to drop a few comments. You might have heard something that just kind of caused a light bulb to turn on and something that just popped for you. We would love to hear that. So um, if you'd like to take a moment to type that in the chat window of just a, a quote or a phrase or an idea that stood out to you as helpful or maybe new information that kind of got you thinking, we'd love to see that. Um, and if you have any questions, go ahead and ask those and uh, I'll try to get to as many of those as I can uh, to hand to Dr. Warner and Stephanie at this time. Um, Cindy asks, are we going to talk about specific ways to grow specific pathways back to joy from the big six emotions? Um, we are not necessarily going to break down shame. That would take a session for each topic, right? Shame and anger and whatever. So if you want that, that would be course three of the Deeper Walk Institute. So course three of the Deeper Walk Institute is on emotional healing. We actually have a session on each of those emotions and uh, look at uh, how do I go about creating pathways back to them. What we're gonna be talking about here is a little bit more generic, and that is the idea that there are some generic things that you can do that apply to all of the emotions. And so if you, but, but you need to do them with each emotion, but they're the same things that you do no matter what emotion it is, and that's what we're gonna focus on. That's great. Uh, somebody asked, is flipping the lid the same thing as having my relational circuits off? Basically, yes. Uh, that's a, um, flipping the lid is, is, is a synonym for triggered. I got triggered. And when I get triggered, that's the on off switch going off. My relational circuits go off. Same thing. Okay. A couple of people asked the question about, uh, just wanted to have you restate what happens with zoom and kind of the fatigue that we experience when we're in all these online meetings. Sure. Um, well, again, this, this has largely to do with the speed at which the brain operates and the speed at which signals are sent via the internet. And so the internet is sending a, a really fast stream. It's just that compared to how fast your brain operates, it's slow. And so um, what happens is your brain gets tired of kind of slowing, uh, of trying to make up for the lag. 
And so I am, as I'm trying to read you constantly. So I was just talking to uh, a psychologist on the Deeper Walk board the other day. And he's like, yeah, because he's got Zoom clients all day. He said he's just wiped out by the end of the day trying to stay relationally focused and connected and in sync with somebody on the other end of the line in a way that he doesn't feel fatigued when he's doing it in person. And it's largely just a, a, an issue of how fast things are happening from the way I understand it. Okay, and this one maybe for Stephanie. Uh, uh, did you say that the amygdala is what regulates the sympathetic, which is the gas pedal, and the parasympathetic brake nervous systems? The amygdala is just an assessment. It, it's just assessing if this is safe or not safe, and it sends signals then to the autonomic nervous system, and 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 then the whichever system is deemed necessary clicks in. So let's uh, define automatic nervous system. Can you give us a brief explanation of what that is? Because <clears throat> I don't think that's a term I used in my explanation. So when you say automatic nervous system, what should come into somebody's mind when they hear that? Uh, the autonomic nervous system is the engine that drives. Oh, I said that wrong. I said automatic. It's autonomic. Sorry. <laughs> autonomic. Yeah, that's fine. It is automatic. <laughs> um, it is, it's this, it's the, the driving system. It's like the engine that drives our bodies and it operates on a subconscious, it op op operates in that fast track. So we're oftentimes not aware of what is happening there. Um, that's one of the things we'll talk about next in the quieting is becoming aware of what our body is doing and learning to feel that rev and, and know what it is and then knowing how to apply some new skills. And then on the other hand, we're starting to feel that shutdown because then that's the, uh, that's the break when, when, when our body goes into shutdown um, and we either want to go into hiding or being super quiet or unseen or unnoticed. Um, you know, just becoming aware of what's happening in the body and then, and then how to talk to yourself through that and how to ask Jesus to intervene. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, person just asked a question about, is there a PDF of the note somewhere? Yes, I uh, sent that out last night to those who had registered by last night. I sent it out this morning to those who had registered within the last half hour uh, today. And uh, it will also be on our course page. So this course is being recorded. And by Friday night, it'll be on the course page. So you go to Deeper Walk International, go to the Building Balance Online Conference page where you bought this course and log in. And at the top, you'll find the videos by Friday night. And at the bottom, you'll find a link to the PDF handouts. Um, and uh, Kim says, I just wanna say how thankful I am that they included left brain beliefs. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's helpful. And it's very helpful for me, Dr. Warner, to hear you distinguish between the, the left brain beliefs that can drive some of those left brain emotions and then the right brain attachment issues that can drive the right brain um, emotions and just how to, they need different, different responses because they're coming from a different part of our brain. Yeah, they are. I had the, uh, you know, the honor of writing a book with Dr. Uh, Dr. Wilder on um, applying all of the brain science stuff that he's learned to the leadership task. And we're actually uh, writing a new version of that right now for the corporate world. And so I've had a chance to talk to him a little bit about this lately. And, and one of the things that he let me know was, for example, um, validating a right brain emotion always works because you're, you're like, oh, you're feeling this. This is what that's going on. But on the left side, you, you have to be careful with that because sometimes somebody say, oh, I just hate this person. They drive me crazy. And you, you don't want to validate their belief, right? You go, well, you're right. You absolutely should feel this, you know, this way about them because you're absolutely right about them. And so uh, understanding the difference between there can be a, an emotion I'm feeling on this side of my brain that isn't being driven by this side uh, can help me know what to validate, what not to validate. And uh, I will say that the narrative engine is an enormous source of an awful lot of our emotions uh, and is a major part of emotional regulation. It's just that it gets so much attention in the literature that we tend to emphasize this part a little bit more uh, because it is often missed. I actually want to mention that, yes, on our Deeper Walk website, deeperwalkinternational.org, if you go to a little tab at the top that says Shop Now, that'll take you to our online bookstore. I just need to point out that our online bookstore is different than where you purchase this uh, streaming resource. So sadly, these two computer programs don't talk to each other, so you have a different account with each one, which we apologize for. But if you go to our online bookstore, you'll, if you type in Course 1 or just type in Course, it'll actually pop up all courses, Course 1, 2, 3, and 4. And course three is on emotional healing. 
And as Dr. Warner mentioned, he has an entire uh, session on returning to joy from each of these big six negative emotions. Uh, these are actually on sale right now in our USB flash drives. Um, they're normally $49 for this eight hour course, of course, one or two or three or four. Um, but you can buy all three or sorry, all four for $119. Uh, so it's like 32 hours of teaching. Um, and uh, so anyway, you might want to check that out if you want to learn more. Course three, emotional healing. A couple comments of people saying, uh, Wendell says, this content is awesome. Um, somebody said, this is great. You're confirming what I was taught in YWAM uh, counseling schools regarding inner healing, and you're taking me further. Um, another person says, holy buckets, so much data. And I've been through all of course, all Deeper Walk courses, one, two, three, and four. Um, so yes, uh, Brad, yes, this is new content. Stephanie and Mark has been working on this for some time now. Um, but it's it's uh, new areas that are going beyond of what is in some, of course, uh, one through four. And I'm glad you're finding it helpful.